G'day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Brass on Tap, our first Saturday morning uh, episode. Uh, and obviously, the reason we're having these Saturday morning episodes is because people from the different hemispheres or time zones were going to have to have this. And if you saw a previous video of me asking for a troll, Saturday seemed to be the day that everyone could do. And obviously, this is an exciting one. We have the incredible world-renowned educator and trumpet player, uh, Greg Spence, with us, who is the creator of a mystery to mastery uh, so it's going to be incredible uh, just a few things obviously before we get the stream started if you missed my stream two nights ago with Ryan Quigley oh go check it out it was what a beautiful person and what an incredible trumpet player and he some of the insights into uh, how he deals with uh, the anxiety or the or the just the the stuff that he's had to deal with in his life and still be where he is at and just the direction it took him to get to where it is is an incredible listen uh, and I encourage you to go check it out while you're there why not check out the rest of the videos I have an incredible artist over there um, and I've got incredible artists coming up uh, so but also make sure you either hit the likes on certain videos that you like, um, give me feedback in the comments, uh, hit the notifications or the whatever you need to do to keep track of these videos because if you don't, you might miss them and then you'll have to catch up on them. And there's so many people out there that I'm trying to get on for you and I really hope that you guys are enjoying it. So I need to shut up and we need to get my guest on. So how about we get the stream started? <laughs> Yes, ladies and gentlemen, episode 21 with the Australian legend, Greg Spence. Uh, as, as you might have read in the description, he is the legend behind Mystery to Mastery. And I'm pretty sure he's a pro golfer as well. So anyone out there, share it with your golf mates and he might be able to help you out with that. Before we get uh, before I just, well, I'm just going to shut up and get him on. Greg, how you doing? I'm not a pro golfer. Not oh, you're not a pro course. golfer. Okay. No, I'm <laughs> No. Okay. No, no, no. You can't. No, no, no. Okay. That, I got that one wrong. You're, you're a very good golfer. You analyzed the golf and you, and you had an incredible round. Is that right? Is that, is that how it went? Oh, no. Well, basically, a couple of years ago, I played for the first time in five years and I was terrible as I've been for the last 35 years. And I figure, well, I'm moving up to paradise. I live in a place called Coolum Beach in uh, Queensland, about an hour Beautiful north of place. Brisbane. And I thought, I'm going to be playing some golf. So why try and fix 35 years of bad right-handed habits? I'm going to teach myself to play left-handed. <laughs> and basically it felt I've done nothing left-handed. People always go, oh, you must be ambidextrous or blah, blah, blah. If it had have felt anything other than ridiculous, wouldn't have done it because it's not a, uh, you know, a, a proper experiment, you know, yeah. project. And it just so happened that I worked on it and I worked on it. And uh, then I decided just because if you're going to do something, you might as well go all the way. I, I, I started, I joined a, a tournament, signed up for a tournament. And it just so happened on the first day, you can see behind it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Just in that <laughs> there. Uh, I happened to come out and play the best round left-handed that I ever played and, and won the day. <laughs> and and that's, the cool thing was I was playing with it. I was just going to say, that's exactly Sorry? the whole concept of, of what you promote. You know, like you're, you were right-handed, never played left-handed, but then you analysed, created yourself, uh, re-taught yourself how to play golf in a completely different way, like you apply with, the, with brass instruments as well, and well, made that, yourself that better. basically the whole point. Yeah. Yeah, that's that was the whole point. Is I wanted to become the beginner again, uh, to put myself in the shoes of my subscribers and my my students to go. What are they dealing with? What are they, you know, what do they need? And Arnold Jacobs called it the psychology of strangeness, the sensation of strangeness, where mm -hmm. some of the, some of the things that I promote to get the drills to promote easier brass playing feels so foreign that people can very quickly write them off and reject them without understanding exactly the 
principle and the purpose behind the drill, they can feel so strange and so unrelated to their regular playing. And especially if you've got someone, which is mostly the people that I meet, rather inefficient, limited techniques. So in order to expand their playing and, you know, get rid of these uh, inefficiencies and limitations, we've got to go to the extreme and go, well, what does it feel like to play really, really easily, really mm. open, you know, just just taking it to the to the extreme. Yeah, it's great. So I'm, I'm really looking uh, forward been, to... It's been a wild experience. Yeah, really looking forward to diving into this with you, uh, Greg. It's it's something that I I, I got into your uh, mystery and mastery um, oh, quite a while ago. I definitely loved I loved all your videos that you're doing, and um, and I think the world needs to know more of it. And obviously, you you're involved in ITG, which we'll get to later on uh, in this stream, which is incredible as well. Uh, but firstly, I'd just like to say I'd just like to um, say thank you. Uh, obviously in Australia it's nighttime over there and I'd just like to find out how this last year's been for you uh, and and how things are going over in Australia and just find out where you guys are at and and how life is uh, musically for you at the moment I, yeah I almost find, I'm almost reluctant to say because when I see from my students all through Europe the UK America you guys still in lockdown you know and it's, well, it's bad yeah. uh, we, we didn't really, especially up here in Queensland, Victoria copped it down in Melbourne. They've just come out of another breakdown and they, a, a, a lockdown and yeah. they copped it for a long time. But up here, if I can say it quietly, it's been kind of life as normal. Here I am going out playing golf and walking on the beach and, yeah. and, and doing stuff. And and, and I, I, I just haven't put much online just out of respect and care for the people that are are stuck at home and, and dealing with this horrible situation, you know. Uh, so the online thing, of course, as you would expect, mm -hmm. has been quite busy. Uh, again, I didn't promote my material uh, besides my golf you know, escapades <laughs> because I know people are working, they're making money. How can I go online and say, mm -hmm. here, come and pay to join up with my course yeah, and completely. stuff like that? So I was putting out, yeah, so... But life uh, has generally just been life as normal up here, really. We, we had a, a couple of oh, uh, six weeks or so when the restaurants closed and all that sort of yeah. thing, and uh, like everyone did. But it's it's been normal up here most of the time. A few restrictions numbers-wise. Uh, but again, in the midst of it, they still allowed football games to happen. And whilst they were sprouting the 1.5 social distancing rule, 1.5 <laughs> metre, yeah. We're standing in a crowd of 15,000 people outside the Gabba to see <laughs> the mighty magpies get beaten by Brisbane. Um, it's, yeah, it was, it's kind of mad, but yeah. they're, they're trying to get on with it. So anyway, let's it, hope that, that things clear up real quick. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's I guess there's a, a, a nice feeling, really, that there are some countries that have actually managed to continue yeah it is it is so annoying to still be in the uk where where it's we're still coming out of lockdown but we can see a light and we're aiming for that light and gigs are starting to come in for some of these guys especially the guys and getting on the channel which is awesome to see and uh i right. and, and i right. can't i can't wait for everyone to get back so i'm so happy for you that everything and and people in australia that everything did sort of you know come back to more normality a lot quicker uh so your playing career like yeah how, how did you start you uh you know like let's take us back to the beginning because you you self-proclaimed you know you said you, you weren't a very good corner player so uh, how do how have you turned that apparent you know uh, this this person who humble beginnings uh and now you've turned into a humble person but with being one of the most sought after trumpet players you know one of the first call trumpet players in in australia so how did that happen uh, yeah that's, that's a really good question uh, the the intention was to never become a full-time musician per se I was fascinated by the cornet. Apparently, I wanted to play saxophone. <laughs> uh, it's a sexy instrument. My my mum, right, and sexy fella, as you can <laughs> exactly. see. So, uh, <laughs> so apparently, yeah, my mum found the God bless her. Um, she found the Wodonga Citizens Brass Band and um, went down there and said my son would like to play saxophone. And they've, of course, gone, we don't have saxophones, but we have cornets. Bring him along. 
he can learn music and then he can go on to saxophone later. Well, yeah. I got to the corner. I kind of enjoyed it and they they gave me a mouthpiece yeah. and said, right, go home and practice this for a week. And so I'm going <laughs> and I couldn't do it. And um, the, the, I'd heard this buzzing sound like a duck and, and, and stuff. So my sister could pick it up. So I remember her walking around. <laughs> because she could do it and I couldn't, right? Yeah. Ironically, I go around the world now teaching people to not buzz the mouthpiece. We'll talk about that later. But I um, got given the mouthpiece and then I got given the instrument and I found it challenging. The sound of it I liked. And, in fact, there was over here we've got the last post, of mm -hmm. course, the, the trumpet fanfare in America. They've got taps and it's uh, there was a girl who was pretty, and I'm like, that girl's playing the last post. I want to do that. So I yeah. practiced the last post for hours and hours and hours because if she could do it, I could do it sort of thing. And so there's a lot about it, the belief system coming in there. However, the techniques that I um, was taught and, well, not really taught, you just, they buzz your mouthpiece, here's the instrument, go practice sort of thing. And uh worked very hard and, when I came, was developing. And then I happened to stumble across James Morrison when I was As 16 or so, my Australia. parents did, <laughs> right? Yeah. He, um, he he played at a, a private function over in Albury and I was from a place called Wodonga, which is on the border of Victoria and then Albury's on the border of New South Wales. So they're twin cities. Yeah. And my parents, my dad was a banker, that back when banks were respectable <laughs> institutions who cared for people um and he they went to a corporate function and james got up and played and he's a few years older than me but it was just after he'd recorded james morrison at the winery and i'd just heard in that sort of time frame i remember waking up one night and hearing may and lee morgan and i'd never heard that sort of music before mm. and i just remember hearing Maynard, and I didn't know who Maynard Ferguson was, but I remember hearing this sound that was like a trumpet except higher was the way that I, talked, <laughs> yeah. I thought about it. And then I heard Lee Morgan playing Sidewinder and ah. I thought, what's this music? It's wild, you know? Mm. And then um, I got to play in my, my first stage band with a friend of mine at Wodonga High School and we were playing the theme from SWAT <laughs> and there, there was, you know, drums and bass and keyboard and all sorts of stuff. And so the commercial music thing, uh, really appealed to me. And I, I say this with the absolute and utter respect. I've got a balloon on my finger. Or we'll, become <laughs> we'll get to that later. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, as a teenager, I remember watching an orchestral performance and seeing the trumpet players sitting there a lot. Mm. So it's just this particular thing that I saw and they, they weren't playing, sitting there. And then all of a sudden, Da, 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 da. Is that it? And I just remember thinking, gee, that must be boring. They don't get to play much. <laughs> anyway, true, so that's you, the, from the brains of kids. And and so I just remember going, oh, in a big band, you play all the time and, and orchestras, you don't play much. So let's go with the music. Uh, then I, I gave up playing for a little while. I studied um, a double degree in accounting computing because wow. my parents were like, get a, get a career mm -hmm. and then music's a fallback. So I as a fallback and then you can do music. And I, I, I survived a year and a half of, at, at uni doing academic stuff and I hated it. And so I uh, worked at a chain supermarket, Kmart, and then uh, for a year or so just to make some money and then moved to Melbourne and applied for the Victorian College of the Arts and uh, my audition was, hello, Greg, welcome to the college. Look, um, play a tune. So I had, I think I'd programmed Misty into a QY10 Yamaha sequencer, really early model sequencer. And I just sequenced in the piano uh, music from the sheet music yep. and played Misty over the top of it and some dodgy blue. And they've gone, great, Greg, play something you've never played before. And I'm um, like, all right. Whatever. No, 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 no. That's just jazz. 
You're just you're just playing swing. Play something you've never played before. Come on. <laughs> Play guys. Play banana. Uh, I remember saying, I don't know what trip you guys are on, but I'm, I'm here to learn. I gave up my job and moved to Melbourne to, to you know, the, that's the words that I used. And so I played something I thought resembled a banana and then they've gone play a bushfire. And I played something that resembled the sound of a bushfire and they've gone great. And the, and a guy named Reg Walsh, very famous, is like uh, the, the godfather of Melbourne commercial trumpet yeah. at that stage. Um, he heard me and heard that I had some 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 chops and and thought I oh, will get him for the big band. So I actually got into the college after driving past VCA the following week after the audition. I hated the audition and felt terrible about it and remember driving past going, yeah, whatever, <laughs> VCA, and ended up getting accepted. And the phone started ringing. I, um, I did my course. I practised a lot a lot of really, really horrendously bad things and worked my backside off doing all the wrong things. Uh, arguably they worked because I was playing, but I was hating playing. And a lot of the people that I teach these days are professional players that want to throw their, yeah. their trumpet under a bus. Um, and I just knew that I was not, I remember saying the words, I'm, I'm, I'm a chops player, not an air player. And I didn't know what I meant, but I just knew from what I was sort of seeing in people that you know, this talk about air and, and and using air, and that can be over, you know, we can get too wound up on air, air, air. You know, more air, more air, more air is it the worst advice in the history of yeah. brass playing, and it's everywhere. Um, but I was like a chops player. I could tell that I was just manipulating my chops down. Um, we'll talk about that stuff. Anyway, Definitely. I finished the course. And I, I got a call to with, um, Shirley Bassey at the Melbourne Concert Hall. Lovely. And then I did the very first AFL Grand Final show at the Tennis Centre. Oh, okay, and yeah. And that was a live TV thing in front of 15,000 people and Barnsley was playing, Jimmy Barnes, a famous Brilliant. Australian singer. And, yeah. And, and that was a TV gig then uh, with Peter Sullivan, big band, and then in Melbourne tonight happened. Mm -hmm. And it was a regular Monday night show. Uh, and all of a sudden I'm on the map because I'm on television and, and before long I was doing, uh, for a few weeks anyway, Mel in, Mel in Melbourne tonight, Monday, and hey, hey, it's Saturday on Saturday. And then they both got axed, oh, really? which I don't take any personal respons hey, hey, Saturday responsibility was, for. I remember sitting in my lounge room watching you play on hey, hey, it's Saturday. I loved hey, hey, it's Saturday. It was yeah. absolutely brilliant. And, what um, a great show! It was a great. There's show. no TV around like I mean, these days. It's if I can, really if I can drop, if I can drop some of these photos in, Greg, you can explain them. I found these. Yeah. This is a good one. <laughs> Man, I am so gonna fix you up. <laughs> so I play with, a, I play with a called Creative Entertainment Concepts, here's and I've actually got a really cool story. Here's about another good guys, one here right? as well. Have you got one of the? Full... <laughs> right, there you go. <laughs> You're just trying to absolutely discredit the hell out of me. Not, you, not right? at all. I just think it's it's Let's, what what I'm trying to prove with this is the is the thing that you you do anything you you play your gigs. You know we're musicians, we're entertainers. We're not it, not not everything you. doesn't have to be bells and whistles. Do you know what I mean? We do, we we're, we're music well, makers. Let me, so. let, let me explain. And <laughs> there's you haven't you didn't see one one with with us uh, in football costumes, did you? Oh, I didn't discover that we, one. We lead the right. So we lead the AFL parade. You know, it's massive in Melbourne. Yeah. And so we're we're right at the very front. We march the teams through. This is like the Super Bowl. This is whatever the rugby world uh, grand final is in in the UK. So it's a big deal, and there's hundreds of thousands of people on the street. Uh, uh, wacky, the saxophone player in those pictures is an amazing businessman, an amazing saxophone player. And from years and years ago, they had this mob, uh, this little band, uh, uh, busking band called the Wacky Wild Wind Machine, <laughs> and they would busk in the um, the Flinders uh, Burke Street Mall. Anyway, so he ended up turning that into a business that, to this day, is one of the most sought after really? corporate entertainment amazing in the country. 
I've, I've travelled all over the blooming world with these guys doing different kinds of, for Citibank, doing a week-long uh, corporate functions where you run fun stuff and play songs mm -hmm. and and they, they um, do a lot of uh, talking and emceeing for big corporate mobs. So it was a great gig. But, yep, we, we'd dress up and we'd get okay. out there and have a great time. So I got asked by someone you are probably quite familiar with now, a wonderful man and extraordinary trumpet player named Dave Elton. Oh, yes. You know Dave. Dave He's from Perth. Well. Yeah. He's playing his associate principal of London Dave Symphony. London Not Symphony. a bad gig. Yeah. <laughs> right. I'm hoping to get, I'm hoping to get him right. on this as well. But I think he might still be in Australia at the moment. So. Oh, is he? Okay. I think okay. he might be, yeah. Well, he uh, organised for me to go into the Sydney Symphony and play the Pixar show. So they show all snippets of Pixar, Bugs Life, Toy Story, Cars, the yep. um, Incredibles, all that sort of stuff, and they play it on the screen and and hell of a gig, like scary gig. Mm. And I'm thinking, yeah, the Incredibles, Wayne Bergeron, I know the theme and Wayne, <laughs> you know, record ordered that and I've heard it and I'll hook into that with the orchestra and they won't know what hit them. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, I'm in the taxi going from Sydney airport to the Sydney opera house. And Dave rings and says, Oh man, I'm working on this, this piece. Uh, I've got a recital coming up. You just play lead on everything. <laughs> and my heart stopped. And, yeah. and, and then I'm sitting in the Sydney opera house with this book of music and i'm playing principal trumpet on all of it and yeah. i'm sitting i kid you not i'm sitting in the you know down in this room and i literally said to myself spence you've done it this time <laughs> right? yeah. so anyway we we did the gig uh the the friday night we've gone oh well you know wasn't perfect, but we, we, you know, we got left room for improvement, but it was fine. No one would know. We knew the little bits and pieces that we didn't, mm -hmm. you know, that weren't a million percent. After one rehearsal for the first act, one rehearsal for the second act, <laughs> and then yeah. do the show. You know, you know what it's like yeah. these days. It's ridiculous. Saturday afternoon, I probably played the best gig of my entire life as far as accuracy and style. Just nailed it. I could not be happier. And it's a big choppy gig. And of course, we had to go back and do it that night again. Mm -hmm. So that night was just hang on to your hats and, and get through it. And it was fine. It was terrific. Point of the story is that is high pressure, mm -hmm. not paid particularly well. Orchestras, when you go in and do that stuff, they've got a fee. It's not great. But it's an amazing experience. You don't do it yep. for the money as a freelancer. Yep. You go into, I'm sure if LSO rang up and said, come in and and do, you know, like I did West Side Story with the orchestras and all this sort of yeah. stuff. It's not about the money. It's no. just the gig, and it's amazing. The following week, I'm doing the AFL Grand Final, Hawthorne versus Fremantle, dressed as a football with Wacky, <laughs> walking down Flinders Street. Dressed as a football. Now, I've played, the Colling I've played the Collingwood theme song as loud as I could and got booed by at least 50,000 people. Because <laughs> for those who don't know Collingwood, they are hated and they're my team. So here I am one week playing in what would be considered a most prestigious gig. Mm -hmm. And the following week, having an absolute ball, getting paid 10 times the cash, yeah. dressed up as a football, you figure it out. It was exactly. fun. Yeah. Right? You've you got, you got to find that balance, you? you got to find that balance. That's really funny. <laughs> Look, if you're going to make a living as a musician, you've got to be prepared to just go out there and work. I don't care what anyone says. For me, a um, a black bow tie in an orchestra is a more of a costume than... I, I'll, I'll make a living playing. If someone wants to pay me to take my trumpet out of my case... Yeah, exactly. I'll do it. Well, back in those days, things have changed. Things have changed quite a, significantly now that I'm up here and a mortgage and live live in paradise i'm quite selective about the gigs that i'm doing but um I'm, I'm i put all my energy and effort into my into my web of course website, and, and teaching you know, and teaching everything and, yeah course, absolutely um you did however there's a very uh world famous band uh that recently started they escaped victoria and started doing a little tour um and you covered uh, only mr just. mr Irwin himself um i'll just put a pop a picture up here um there it is 
backstage with Cat Empire. Hey. Um, there we yeah. go. So, uh, ag again, walking into someone else's... This is before we play a video. I'm going to play a video soon of you laying it down with um, the Melbourne Jazz Orchestra, Big Bend, um, playing lead on that uh, with Matt Jodrell, an incredible trumpet player yep. uh, as well. Yep. Um, sure but just before we get into that, when you what's your concept? You're walking into someone else's shoes. It's not your gig. You know, it's it's much it's much easier job if it's your gig. You know, you rock up, you're comfortable, it's your job. You're rocking up into a band. I mean, you, you probably know them before anyway. Um, they uh, the way the way I met them when I was younger was I rocked up to a jam session and they're all there. This is before they were Cat Empire, you know, and I played I played with a little bit then, you know. But um, yeah. but yeah, but when you're walking into say someone else's shoes, uh, what's your concept? Are you you just going to play the book? the way you feel, or do you do your research and you listen to how that person plays and you apply that to when you're going in? Both. Both. <laughs> <laughs> I listen to it and I hear the way that they play it. And then I go, uh, I, I hear not so much, definitely a style, but we've all got our individual nuances in our style in playing particular mm -hmm. styles of music. Of and this is a, and we a, a should. scar fun so absolutely yeah. so I, I don't want to sound like ross i love mm. ross and mm. love, ross sounds fantastic mm. but ross sounds like ross and i i have my sound and i know that it blends and it's stylistically right so i listen to the music i understand the cutoffs the longs the shorts the this or that i've got to the the lead singer harry is a trumpet player as well mm -hmm. so one of the lead singers uh so i need to blend with him i need to blend with kieran the trombone player and then I hear the lines the way that I do and play it the way that I do. I've got a different sound. Yeah. When I play that style of gig, I've got the brighter, you know, um, the sort of commercial sound where jazz, mm -hmm. uh, where Ross has got the, the darker, jazzier sound. Yeah. So I'm going to play it as I hear a horn section. They, they booked me to play like me. If they were trying to say, oh, play with less, you know, that or less, yeah. Yeah. You go, well, you got the wrong guy because yeah. I can only play the way that, that I can play, you know. That's good. Um, and I wouldn't I wouldn't want to to change that. And the worst thing I reckon do is the bunk fiction years ago. Were you ever in Melbourne when Funk Fiction were playing? No, I don't at think at the I was, Evelyn no. Hotel. Tuesday night, five hundred people in there, blooming steamy, stinky room of um, earth, wind and fire and uh, brand new heavies and all this sort of stuff. And it went nuts. And I was filling in for a, a guy that I won't mention, but uh, you feel like you've got to try and cover this like him. Yeah. And you go, no, yeah. don't play like that. Play yeah. like you. And I get yeah. booked because of the way that I play. And you, you've got to just sort of turn up and go, this is what I've got to offer. This is what I've been booked for. Yeah. If you want me, here I am. It's Otherwise, a, book someone else. It's pretty it's simple. A, equation. It's a great concept that I think a lot of guys need to realize is that they've booked you, they've rung you for a reason. So go in and do what you do and yeah. don't try and don't try and live up to someone or, or just, you know, just play the book. Absolutely. That you do. So, but yeah. Anyway. That's uh, a tough, tough thing to learn. It is. It is. It's very hard. I learned, I learned very hard way, you know, like trying to do this and that. And I'd listen to people to the nth degree and, oh, I must play it this way. And it's, it's like, oh, yeah, just, just be me. So. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, before we get into uh, some incredible behind the scenes learning how to actually play the trumpet. Uh, so everyone listening here, we do have 18 people in with us. Please rack your brains while I play this for you for the questions uh, for Greg. Remember, Greg has probably been there, tried it, done it. And he's looking for you to ask your questions so he can Bring help, it on. he can help you out. He is super <laughs> excited about this stuff and he thrives on it. So, but just setting this up, this is Matt Drodrell playing um, with the Melbourne Big Band. And you can see our man Greg Spence playing lead on this. Enjoy. This is Things to Come.
absolutely brilliant. I, lo- I absolutely love that. Um, yeah, it's incredible. And the the biggest thing I pick up uh, whenever I see you play, uh, Greg, is you've you've got to you've got your playing to a point where it, it's almost. I'm not going to say effortless because it does take effort to play a trumpet. But you know what I mean? You make it look easy. And I know a lot of people go, oh, this guy, you know, oh, this guy makes it look easy. This guy makes it look easy. But you do. And but that's come from obviously a lot of practice. Uh, and before we just before we get into it, um, Mike Lovett dropped yep. in and I just wanted to uh, share his comment with you. Uh, he says, hi, Greg. Great to see you here. Good morning, Australia. Your teaching is really brilliant. And we are all lucky to be able to learn from your knowledge, wisdom and talents. I hope that one day we'll meet and drink a beer together. Great to hear your stories on here. And thanks uh, to Ben for getting you on. Mike, you are more than welcome. Uh, Good morning, Mike. It's an absolute you, pleasure to have Greg here. Uh, guys, If in the comments, please get your questions in because now we're going to dig into the nitty and gritty of um, of the mystery of mastery of actually being able to play brass and trumpet. So please get your comments in um, and yeah, or even just say where you come from so we can say hello. Uh, so Greg, yeah, as I was saying, you you sort of make this quite easy. Has it, it, it obviously hasn't always been easy and you do claim in some of your videos that you, you was, I, I dealt with a similar thing to you. You were downstream, top lip over bottom lip that kind of stuff you know like there you go yeah that's what you were yeah it's and so anyway so shall we just introduce mystery and mastery a little bit um to the guys so hopefully it sparks some questions in their head and everything like that and just how you came about developing this lesson and and workplace of of this definitely sure Sorry, were you going to put something up? Oh, my mistake. No, no, okay, sorry. So, what, <laughs> no, no, no. Um, uh, so basically what, what happened is I got to about oh, halfway through my College of the Arts, Melbourne University course, and I was practising like nothing else. And we were going through all these different methods and you'd, you'd have the method of the week sort of thing and Caruso and this exercise mm-hmm. and that exercise. And I... I love learning but if i'm working on something and not getting a result i'm not a happy little camper and i was working my absolute backside off to play the trumpet i I knew it i i I could see people playing easier than what i was and that's where that whole line of i feel like i'm a chops player not an air player without Mm -hmm. knowing what i meant and it got to the point mid course that one thing I thought I can't tongue correctly because I'm being taught to tongue behind tip of the tongue behind my top teeth Mm -hmm. up there. And I couldn't do it. Couldn't do it because I've got this big rolled overbite and just couldn't work. So the tip of my tongue was behind my bottom teeth and I was using the middle part of my tongue to articulate. And I remember the day where I was, just sat on my bed, put the instrument down and said, Greg, you're never going to make it as a player. Just be cool with that. Play for fun and let's go and find something else to do because you can't do it. I was putting in a lot of effort and getting nowhere. And I had a teacher, I won't say names, but he was a well-known high note teacher, a player Mm -hmm. back in the day. And he's doing a 45 degree sit up and holding his trumpet and playing double A's that were blasting my face off. And I'm being taught all about strength. You've got to get blood on your chops. You've got to get, that's more air. It's this, it's just blooming more air. I remember thinking, if I'm working this hard on a middle C and then on a high C I'm working this hard, if I'm going to play an octave higher, I'm going to bust myself. (laughs) And some people do. Something is not going to work. And on the, well, I mean, I've put on the, the intro to my um, ITG first. That's, it's going <laughs> to, it's going to raise some eyebrows. This <laughs> presentation, let me tell you. But this um, uh, girl who was in South Africa at the World Cup who was playing a Vuvuzela and it's like just a straight trumpet made of plastic, started blowing it. She perforated her larynx. She Ooh. tore her throat, right? From instinct, the instinct is blow mm. the hell out of the thing, make lots of noise. So I'm working really hard. A, a wonderful dear friend of mine, Paul Williamson, and I used to get together 40 degrees 
out in the shed practicing blooming high note drills and stuff just to develop our chops and I'm, I'm going can't be right and then i'm watching el Vizzuti playing and i'm going hang on <laughs> he's playing like that and this is all pre-youtube of course so i'm probably just hearing hearing him playing and no i've seen footage and i'm like he's not killing himself and i had a a conversation you'll love this mate with a um wonderful lead trumpet player from sydney mm -hmm. and he goes how are you going greg it was a um uh what's his name uh uh, uh come on greg famous actor hugh jackman mm -hmm. it was oh, a, yeah. a, a press call a press call for hugh jackman and he goes hey greg what are you doing and i said oh you know me just working on trying to make it easier and just working on efficiency and he goes greg you gotta realize the trumpet's hard work. It's just hard work. And I just let it go. But within the same conversation, we started talking about Vizzuti, who was coming out for the Melbourne International Festival of Brass. And the same guy says, oh, isn't it incredible how easily he plays? <laughs> yeah. This is what's happening, right? So anyway, I let it go uh, at the time, but it, it speaks volumes. And... So it got to the point where I was going to give up playing. I was killing myself. I was I was not improving. And I was talking at a party to Eric Clay, the bass trombone player from Melbourne Symphony at the time. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, well, Greg, if you uh, want to improve, you've got to practice like a virtuoso. And I took that for me was there's the, I, I can't practice anymore. I'm up for doing the work, but I don't know what the work is, but there's clearly something wrong. And that said to me, uh, start and research. If you really want to figure it out, start and look around because you can keep doing the same exercises that, you know, the madness, of course, you yeah. know, repetition of the same thing, expecting a different outcome. And so I thought I've got to, I've got to uh, break things down here and sort it out. And then I, I did 16 weeks with a blues brothers show up and down the East coast of, of australia and i was in cans of all places and the guys came in and said would you believe bobby shoe is in town because i uh being on tour and he was in cans the same time i was wow so i went up and saw him and at that stage i had a goatee and his head and i said i was a friend of scott tinkler's and he goes no joke <laughs> uh, did i scotty tinkler you got yeah. scott He's oh yeah incredible incredible trumpet player he says, yeah and um he he knew bobby and and uh so i said to him can i please get a lesson i've, I've got some real issues and so i turned up at 10 o'clock in the morning and he, he's in his hotel room and coughs up a lung and he's got emphysema and hangover from too many little vb throwdowns and <laughs> and he pulls out his trumpet flaps his chops puts his harmony mute in and plays low c to double c chromatically mezzo piano and I went, right, yep, good. Let's start with that, and then we'll do something else <laughs> in the next 10 minutes. I said to him, I've got, I got real problems, and he goes, where's your air going? And I went, and he goes, no, nah, you got to get it out straight. And we drew a target, put it on the wall. Get your air there. And I went, and, of course, it felt ridiculous. Yeah. And... Yeah. Uh, but seeing him play was all I needed to go. I know there's a problem mm -hmm. and I've got it. And I left that lesson going, yeah, I was right. I've got lots of problems that I need to change. So that's when the research began. And I started reading a bunch of different books, including acoustics books, physics books, and sitting down. And this is a thing that I have not emphasized anywhere near enough in my course that, and it's bizarre because it's what I did but sat down with a mirror, I had to stop because the minute we do it, one, we roll the lips down so we mm -hmm. lose alignment. Mm -hmm. We also engage the abdominal muscles. We close the throat off. So we go into, you know, the known after the Italian doctor, Dr. Velsa with this thing for working on people's ear, nose, throat, issues and whatever but it's known as the Velsalva maneuver when childbirth defecation you close the throat off you engage the abdominals and that's a good thing for some 
reasons, but not for brass playing. No. And I was doing it all the time from I literally. Now, up here I've learned, <laughs> this is how's this for preparation. I've learned uh, that on the Sunshine Coast, you use a lot of valve oil because it's very humid. <laughs> yes. And I haven't touched it. I haven't touched the trumpet in, uh, well, I, I was teaching yesterday, but haven't touched it today. I've played golf this morning. I used to play, so the valves actually might not work, but we'll see what happens. <laughs> I used to play. <laughs> throat blows, and I hope I don't blow your microphone off. I'll, I'll, I'll turn around this way. But the throat was closed the whole time, right? Yeah. I can still play. And it's closed the whole time. Yeah, that's crazy. Right? Doesn't feel good. And it doesn't sound. All of a sudden I open up. Oh. I'm not sure whether you can tell the difference over the mic, but the feeling of it and the sound of it are remarkably different. Mm -hmm. Okay. So basically I was playing with full-blown Valsalve maneuver the whole time, trying to play lead, bottom lip coming under, headaches, teeth together, migraines, how I didn't get a hernia or perforate my larynx, it's still beyond me because I used to practice really hard. Mm. But then after the lesson with Bobby, I'm like, got to play like that, got to get the air out straight. So I would sit there with my mirror. I was at a private school, Ivanhoe Grammar, hoping my students wouldn't turn up so I can sit there. <laughs> Did I say that on a public forum? Yeah. I love teaching now because people that come to me want to be here, not getting out of, of maths and science. <laughs> Got to play like that. A visualiser. Interestingly, when I was 15, given a visualiser, look at what your lips do, Greg, to which I went even back then. Mm. So how's that helpful? It's destructive, <laughs> I don't know that much. But for now, I actually use it, eyes closed, to visualise the feeling, internalise the feeling of what's going on when we place it over lips that are not touching. The lips do not have to touch to create a sound on an instrument. Yeah. We'll come to that. <laughs> so I spent ages... <laughs> Look at this. Do I play like that? No. <laughs> but it's a great place to start yeah. for developing the sensation, the freedom. And I, now, years and years gone by, the way I'm talking about it is very, very far developed from back in these days. Mm -hmm. But I knew even instinctively back then to look, to close the eyes and to feel, to replicate, See it in the mind, feel it. There's a sound involved. If you went to any reputable brass, especially on trombone, you should get a lesson, something along the lines of mm. there's your sound, right? And it's more true than what people realise. And so I'm working on the feel, the sound, the look, and embedding it. Now, of course, I couldn't play, and one of the big things was my teeth were closing up, so I had to stop my teeth from closing up. I started off by pulling the end off a of biro and mm -hmm. shoving between my teeth, and that was starting to cost me a little bit too much because I was biting through too many of them. <laughs> so I ended up buying some dental putty, right? Oh, okay. If you want something, you get two compounds of dental putty, and I put them in, put it, fed it into the lid of a pen, Mm -hmm. And it came out with a thing looking like this. All right. This is one that I used to practice with 20 years ago, right? And that was just to and stop your so teeth from closing up. Yeah. And let me tell you the hundreds of those things that I chewed through <laughs> in the process of learning. One of the main lines I use with my students now is get your jaw down, corners in. Mm -hmm. Right? We'll come to that. So... Basically, I'm recognising the problems with my playing. And one of my major things now, and one of the major things for the International Trumpet Guild, present first one, they've given me two, which is cool, one for the Amazing. psychology and one for the um, for the process, uh, is what can, what can you kind of do sometimes? Mm -hmm. What can't you do? It's pretty logical. Yeah. 
But even the what can you do is shrouded in, you know, a bit of confusion because we've got this, I don't know whether you saw the video I put up last week called The Illusion of Competence. It's a great video. I highly recommend it. anyone who hasn't seen it, please watch it. It's really important stuff, mm. right? And mm. so when we ascertain what we can actually do in reality, then we can build on that. And for me at the start was to just keep my my, uh, my jaw down, stop mm -hmm. my teeth from closing up. So I was playing with these things. I mentioned Paulie. I, you know, all my buddies, I'd experiment with them. I said, Paulie, put this between your teeth, see how it goes. And he goes, oh, they're just falling out. Great. Yeah. Cool. So it shows that it's not for everyone, but for me it was really helpful. Uh, then I knew the feeling I was after. There were these, all the, the ideas of lead with the air, the lips, are the vocal cords of the instrument, all this stuff was around. And here I am feeling like I'm blowing the house down and my lips are really clamping up. So I thought, right, in order to figure out and train the body how to do this, let's not try and do it on trumpet. As Arnold Jacobs says, it's the sensation of strangeness. And now I'll, I'll touch on a neurologist that I've just been introduced to since putting these latest videos up and it's blowing my mind as to why I'm on the right track with my teaching. I always <laughs> knew it made sense, but when I hear the science behind it and the neurotransmitters and how the, uh, I'm not even going to be able to remember, um, uh, uh, no, it's not even going to come to my head, these re really weird long words. No. No, it's not going to come. Anyway, <laughs> dopamine is one of them. <laughs> right. Anyway, um, I thought I'll learn on the trumpet, on the trombone, because the trombone, the rim's bigger. Mm -hmm. So there's no sense of having to go, so I could let the lips go. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, what do the vocal cords feel like? Mm, that's hard to do. If the lips interact with the air like they're the vocal cords, which is one of my big mantras, that should suggest that playing's no harder than talking. So I got onto the trombone. And because of the size of the rim, the corners, the aperture corners, and I need everyone to watch closely. Oops. It's the corners of the aperture. There's a lot of talk about the corners of the mouth. Mm-hmm. The corners of the yeah. mouth will activate. But if you start telling people to activate the corners of their mouth, what happens? They squeeze in. Yeah. yeah. Everything tightens. Yeah. Right? They will activate when we find the shape required for whatever pitch. But we want the oscillator, the lips, to be free. Now, I get caned for this. Let me demonstrate, then I'll talk about it. If I'm saying playing's no harder than singing, I want the lips to interact with the air as if they're the vocal cords. Mm -hmm. I'm literally going to get air into my lungs. I was playing with my balloon for an hour. Now I need it and I can't find it. Okay. <laughs> Let's put air into the lungs, mm -hmm. i.e. fill balloon. Now, we all know that I don't need to squeeze this balloon for the air to come out. We just need to let it go. So the, the thoracic system in the body is the same. We expand it. And if we relax, air will come out. <laughs> Simple, logical. So what does it feel like to hum? Mm, what does it feel like to play trumpet? Mm, there's my perfect play. Mm, and I can keep talking to you because I have air in my lungs and I'm not mm -hmm. pushing it. Yep. And I could keep talking without taking a breath. Then we go to active which is the way i used to play all the time mm -hmm. and tighten everything up so basically back in the day it was learn the feeling on trombone but as soon as i pick up the trumpet you just clamp your chops down mm -hmm. it's a completely different process of playing that close this would lock this would push and around the same time I've, i found claude gordon's brass playing is no harder than deep breathing and found out about K modified tonguing. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, the tip of the tongue behind the lower teeth and tonguing with the middle of the tongue is not only an acceptable way of tonguing, but Herbert L. Clark did it, Arvin did it, 
all these amazing Andre Alessandro Barati, if you've heard yeah. him play, like really old recording, Animal. K-modified tonguing, anchor tonguing. Mm -hmm. There's a few names for it. I was doing that. I'm like, all of a sudden I've been validated. <laughs> you know, I, I maybe, maybe I can do this, right? Yeah. And then on the trombone, it got to the point where I, I knew the science so clearly. My belief system was so aligned with what I wanted to achieve that it was impossible for it not to work. It must work. So I'm sitting with eyes closed, very important, eyes closed, holding trombone, passive reduction, no activity. I wasn't using the term passive back then. Mm -hmm. I was just using breathing bags and doing all of the Arnold Jacobs breathing stuff to go, if I'm going to change setup, I might as well change breathing, get it happening as well. And hours and hours and hours and hours, my friend. I bet. Right? And then I'm doing it on the trombone. What does it feel like? What does it look like? What does it sound like? And I'd put down the trombone, pick up the trumpet. <clears throat> All right. It got to the stage where I said to my wife at the time, I've had a few, a <laughs> couple. I said to my wife at the time, I am going to stay here until I figure this out. I'm not leaving the room until I sort this out. And it could be a month because I could feel what was happening on the trombone and I could feel my habits getting involved on the trumpet mm -hmm. and, and sat there what's happening scan 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 my favorite teaching tool now is the magnifying glass okay you turn your you close your eyes because we we lose all of our energy and processing power with the eyes open so my term is you you, you have your eyes open for learning mm -hmm eyes closed for storing and rewiring and that's where the magnifying glass comes in what am i doing what's happening how is it different to the trombone process then put trumpet up what does this feel like <laughs> copy that every time i go to play pinch the lips push the abdominals mm -hmm. choke in the throat <laughs> no that's not what i want and failures are the key to success you certainly are because of the because of the uh the chemicals that no repenifrine epinephrine epinephrine is that one of them and oxychlor oxychloride uh, i'm only just learning them now i've seen yep. this this neurologist and uh all of a sudden i'm like replicate 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 Trombone, trumpet, trombone, trumpet, trombone, trumpet. About half an hour in, all of a sudden, my friend. V for victory. If you don't have a visualizer, V for victory, but make sure your fingers are as wide as your inner rim, right? Yeah, I'm not doing that very well. It's, everything's in reverse. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> anyway, um, sat there and just pretended I was playing trombone let go for the first time in my existence and this note just went car boom the lip let go the body opened up and the sound was insane amazing there it is put the instrument down go and put the kettle on make a coffee and think about it because even then instinctively i knew if i if i was to try it again i would revert to old habits mm -hmm. and eventually i would turn a success into a failure. So put the horn down and go and immerse, absorb the feeling of what happened and picture it in the mind. What happened? What did it look like? Just saying this to you now, I've had this conversation so many times over the years, but to know what I know now, yep. after teaching all these focal dystonia students, I've been doing a research project with a, a dystonia sufferer for the last couple of years as well. And what we've learned and what we're teaching is it's it's going to be groundbreaking, and I happ happily say that out loud because this stuff is not out there. Amazing. And when I see neurologists talking and connect it to the way that I think about learning and teaching, it's it it is literally mind blowing. So I've got this concept, and it's funny. I've got this picture of me up there, but the picture of the portrait. If if you're having trouble with your playing, can you think back to a time when it felt really good, sounded great? Mm. 
there's your belief system right there. I can do this. And you put that on your mind's feature wall and there's a picture of you doing what you wanted to do. If you haven't got that and you need to make changes, well, we make new portraits and portraits are a place in time where something works. So the belief system goes, oh, yeah, I can do that. And you see it and you see it in your mind and you start to create a belief. And this is where I have my biggest problem is getting people to understand where I'm coming from. And so I'm working on their belief system to get them to understand the system based on what it looks like, sounds like, and feels like. Then what happens, I found out about the amygdala and I found out, about, can I can I share a picture with you? I'm not sure if I can. Um, um, anyway. That's, I could probably, yeah, that's let me, no, that's my stuff. Uh, no, that's okay. Um, there, there is a um, way. I haven't quite figured it out yet. <laughs> if you send it to me real quick by a messenger or something, I can put it on. Uh, okay. Uh, no, it doesn't matter. Okay. Look up the vagus nerve. The vagus is a big structure in the body that runs from the gut to the brain, and yep. it carries the serotonin for, for calmness and all this sort of stuff. And uh, Then I found out about the amygdala, which is part of the reptilian brain that that sends off fight or flight messages and uh is a big problem with the belief system mm -hmm. and so what we do to reprogram the amygdala when i i've had lessons where I, the person looks at me and goes and i can tell they're listening consciously going yeah sure great that sounds great but in the background there's this voice going no nah, <laughs> that's yeah. not right and, right it happens i see it and so what we're doing is by using our portrait of a real, that from the frontal lobes starts to send messages to the amygdala and we start to change. The amygdala can remember trauma if you've had a traumatic experience and it's, this is why it is so important in focal dystonia retraining. If you've had a, 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 a traumatic, tragic experience that you can recall, you can picture it in your mind, you have chemical reactions to it. You can feel the gas, you can feel the toxicity, the sadness, the whatever. It's meaty, it's real, it's tangible, it's touchable, it's chunky, it's cellular in the brain. Mm -hmm. So how, so is a visualisation of something that's positive that you, we can connect positive neurotransmitters to and go feel excitement, anticipation, belief, understanding. And then we connect that picture in our mind to the frontal lobes which send the messages down to the amygdala and all of a sudden, Put under a position of uh, pressure or whatever, just learning something new, our belief system's being threatened, all of a sudden we've got this new belief based with, on excitement. So a visualisation, mm. how about that? It's actually, the, I've, you know, I've heard that just visualise it and it's airy-fairy and doesn't make much sense, but when you break it down like this, it is actually a real thing. You can create neural pathways by picking, so, uh, you know, I could talk about this all day long, but basically a lot of the practice is done by visualising. We learn what it looks like, feels like and sounds like, and then you walk down the street and practice. The exercise uh, is just the assessment. Just just on that as well, because I know I know it's great, but my, one of my favourite analogies that you use is the concert hall, because you just sort of break the concert hall down for us. Love please. it. Well, you know that the concert hall's been uh, refurbished. It's been renovated and okay. developed. Right, let me explain. <laughs> yeah, please. Once do. upon a time, the concert hall, concert hall 1.0, was just everyone watching. Bend your finger around, and we're going to put it between the teeth. This is going to really talk about belief systems. I love this stuff. Right, put it between I hope your everyone's teeth. Everyone's doing this at home as well. <laughs> Damn right. Damn right. Now, if you've got locked jaw or any jaw issues. Don't open your mouth too far, but if you can open it, then take a breath. And then let the air come out. Right? So we expanded. And Bobby Shu said to me, be careful saying the word relax because people will fall off the chair. <laughs> I'm giving people a bit more. Going, Let's just assume that you're not going to fall off the damn chair. Right? He was, he was being funny. Anyway, but it's true. We're careful with semantics. But... I don't want you to fall off your chair, but I want you to relax the, the breathing system. <sighs> Have a look at my torso. I don't want any head moving, any lifting up. I just want to get air into the lungs, which are here. 
Mm -hmm. right so if you do it again really slowly and silently you'll get a feeling that i was talking to a professor from a very prestigious uh college in london who goes i've never felt like that when i played i've gone okay and she proceeded to sit there and play and play and play and go i've never been able to play like that i've never just, done that just from one change right just an idea and then we spoke about aperture corners which we'll get into and she played high f at the end of the concert uh, at the end of the concert end of the session yeah and said i've never played that no you're a genius right <laughs> there's no genius about it it's just physics you know, yeah it's just it's anatomy it's acoustics whatever uh so we open up that i want people to recognize that feeling so the eyes have to be closed. We've got to have the magnifying glass set. We've got to scan, feel the back of the tongue go down and open up the airways, the trachea bronchial tree down to the lungs. I want you to feel that openness because that's a massive part of the instrument, mm -hmm. right? There's an air column in the body and the instrument and it's one air column. And it's when the lips get involved, it sets up a sound wave that exists in the body and the instrument. So I want you to have an understanding of what it feels like to do it. So if you do it softly and slowly, you'll feel the openness here. And a lot of time I recognize that feeling. I've watched the videos, but not when I'm playing, because as soon as they play, they go into Valsalva maneuver. Yeah. Everything locks, right? So consider this the whole purpose of the concert hall, which is now developed. Let me explain. Here's the front door to the building. Here's the foyer, oral cavity. The throat are the 10 doors going into the auditorium. Big problem. Then you've got the auditorium. Then, this is gold. I laughed when I figured it out. You've got the orchestra pit, the pit of the stomach. We want the abdominal wall to fall out. We want the diaphragm to drop. We want the stage of the orchestra pit to come out right down low. So now the body's concert hall starts at the front doors and goes all the way down to the orchestra pit. And when we get a breath in, here's our instrument. Mm -hmm. Now, it goes further than this. If I grab the balloon, this is where I start to, you watch the numbers drop off here. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> Actually, the, the numbers are increasing at the moment, so. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Stand by. Okay, there's, there's pressure in the balloon, thanks to the elasticity of the balloon and atmospheric pressure. We've already agreed that I don't need to squeeze that balloon to get the air to come out. It wants to come out. All I need to do is open the fingers. So let's insert that into my body and my lips become the fingers. There is pressure going to move, mm -hmm. right? Now consider this quickly. If I'm going to sing a note, uh, the tissue's not moving. Ah, 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 it's not moving. We're not blowing through the trumpet. <laughs> We're not blowing through the trumpet. When I fill the balloon, you, let's do a poo attack, P-U. I've got the pressure behind my fingers here. All I need to do is open the lips to let the air come out. And the sound that happens is a P, right? So, open the lips and the air is going to come out passively. We do not need any activation of the body whatsoever. For, you know, I'm not saying for every note. No, of course. From pedal C to triple C. But for this note, what I'm going to do is open my lips and the energy that's built up in the body because of the relaxed body the body wants to be here mm -hmm. but we breathe in we expand the intercostal muscles and we open everything up and then I'm, I'm, this is sort of my breath example now is we breathe in and we breathe out and we don't want anything to crimp or lock or pinch at the top of the breath air mm -hmm. in air out so if i was to do this Throat's open, air's not moving. Mm -hmm. And people say you've got to close your throat or the air will come out. No, it won't. 
It can't because it's an atmospheric pressure. Mm -hmm. The only way to get the air to move is to relax the intercostals, the obliques, and get it all to, to come back to here. So that's relaxing muscles. And I'm not falling off the chair, Bobby. Love you. <laughs> um, right? Air in. Now, if I was to open my lip, what's happening? That energy is going to energize the air that's already in the pipe. There's air. Don't do it too hard. Your mouthpiece will get stuck. <laughs> so if I was to open my lips, what's resonance? Two mediums oscillating at the same frequency or more. Let's say two. So the trumpet's already got the note. We need to add the body. Let's open the lips and add the body. I'm going to open my lips and let the sound come back in. There's a random concept. I'm not blowing. Mm. I'm not blowing. I'm releasing energy. And until people understand and tighten the body, tighten the lips, tighten, push and blow through the horn. If all of a sudden I... Body, have a listen to what happens to the sound. Yeah. Oh, it feels terrible. Yeah. I used to feel yeah. like it all the time, right? So, if we can understand that there is a lot, I've got this thing called the Singing C series, and it's all based on that. That we can play all over the horn. There's this relentless message of more air for high notes hmm. more air is not high notes shape change and lips is where pitch changes and i will have this conversation on any platform in person or online to explain this let me do a quick demonstration if Please i do. go <laughs> I just got softer to the point where at the end I was passive and the pitch was changing. But hang on, I'm pulling the air back. How am I getting softer? Because it's less air. You blow faster to play high. How do you play? How, how, how do you blow faster to play high? But, but you, you've got to get more air through the lips to play louder. I'm confused. The fact of the matter is, and this is Bernoulli principle, and it just shoots. And if you're interested in looking at it, look at um uh the foundations of musical acoustics by arthur h bernard mm -hmm. right and, and and talks about bernoulli principle how you get lift with planes and the only thing that determines a flow through an aperture is the aperture itself the velocity at the aperture is the aperture you can arch the tongue in the mouth that will speed the air up between mm -hmm. the tongue and the roof of the mouth but what happens when it drops down again it goes between the teeth and it gets to the lips yeah it will change it's the timbre of the concert hall, but it won't change the pitch alone. And so are the Claude Gordon certified teachers, and I say it out loud because I've had them saying to their students, do not speak to Greg Spence. You can't really? talk to him. I'm sorry, guys. I've had I had a student turn up. I, when I cracked it was when I had a student in my own house in Melbourne, and he goes, please do not say my name. If my teacher knew I was here, and this guy had been learning off this clown for a couple of years, and you should have heard the sound coming out of his horn. And by the time he left the lesson, everything had opened up and it made me angry, you know, seriously. Yeah, of course. It's it's not cool. No. So when you understand that the aperture itself determines the pitch and then we match the resonance of the body to the overtone that we want on the instrument, right? This, my friend, is passive. <laughs> That's the art. I told you about my valve and it's going to work. How's that? Great, isn't it? <laughs> this is passive. Yeah, yeah, you do it. And now I can keep talking until there. Now I'm active and I'm squeezing all the air out. And have a listen to what's happening to my voice. And I'm going to squeeze yeah. all the air out. And all of a sudden, I'm going to get a breath on board and relax the body. And it sounds great. It's easy, right? The psychology of brass playing is just wrong and it's been taught and, and taught and until, thankfully, the modern age, we've got the ability to share this information. It's not about me. I love 
learning. Mm -hmm. And if I can't do something, I've got to figure out why can he do it and I can't. I remember looking at pictures of Arturo and Bobby Shue and Jason and all these amazing players, Vizzuti. Mm. Why can they do what they can do? I, I, I want to play like them. Something's wrong. I'm being told something. It's not working. So you've got to change your modus operandi. And then I learn things and I love sharing it. This is what I do, right? Yeah. And all of a sudden I've learned this stuff and love sharing it, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So basically if we understand the role of the body when it comes to a bit of pipe that's got some air in it and how to make sound out of it efficiently, then we've got the magnifying glass and we play our low C and it's ringing its head and it's really loud. I'll, you know, it's nine o'clock at night here and I'm going to go, ah. I'll never play a note that loud on, on a gig. I'll get sacked <laughs> and it's free, sound free. And so then when we start adding uh, intervals, harmonics, dynamics, where does turn into uh-oh, you know, at yep. what point do we start to choke the body? It's all about that. It's that's, all about that. That's incredible. Uh, it really is. Um, and uh, I, I've got a couple of questions for you. Uh, we've had a couple of people who jump on as well, yeah. um, if I can just uh, put some questions yeah. forward to you. Uh, Martin Martin Flateka, uh, Flateka maybe has come on, and he says, if you are able Hello, uh, to tongue with the tip of your tongue at the roof of your mouth, and he goes – and can do, hang on, I think, it, I think it went before it, and can do ups, what are reasons for choosing one over the other? Whatever works for you anatomically, whatever feels best and sounds best. There you go. Right. And I find that I do both now. I, I probably on a uh, high note, if I was to sit there and here's a, another idea of, of shape and release of the air, I don't even know why I'm going to attempt to do this. We'll see what happens. I'm going to get air in the body. I'm going to preset the volume. I'm going to preset the shape. And I think when I do this sort of thing, air in, set the volume, set the shape. Okay, I've released the air. Let me think. Yeah, I've actually now because I've changed my setup from to I tongue with the tip higher when I'm doing upper register playing. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then if I'm, if I'm first, it goes into K modified, mm -hmm. but let me, I've got a video called Poo Lip Coo KMT in two. <laughs> so if I go Poo Attack and let, let me remind you, I'm letting the instrument, I want the sound coming into a concert hall, not a, a tiny practice room. Mm -hmm. Oh, there. So I'm going to open the poop. Let the... Now that clearly is not an articulation that you're going to be using often, but it's a great practice technique, as is the lip, through the lips, because it gets the teeth apart and creates an aperture. And that's got a very thick, um, real percussive thick sound to the articulation. But let me tell you, a guy who uh, uh, who was on trial for London Symphony, a guy from Copenhagen Co called Bo Fugslung, an amazing trumpet player, he asked his teacher years ago, how do you articulate? And the teacher says, how do you stop wine coming out of a wine bottle? Put a cork in it. Yeah. <laughs> so he started doing that, and to this day, he still starts phrases with the lip attack. Spit rice, right. Bobby Shue would call yeah, it. Yeah, Bobby Shue, yeah. Um, and and on piccolo, even more, he uses that attack. Okay. So if I got poo, I go, I go, I'm gonna, I'm gonna demonstrate the poo attack, the lip attack, coo, double tongue, cook, mm -hmm. cook, cook, back of the tongue, back of the mouth, K modified, and then tip of the tongue at the roof of the mouth. <laughs> They've all got slightly different sounds, but I just want people to consider this. They're all releases of energy. Yeah. Open up and let the sound into the body. 
because the once the lip gets involved on the change of energy from the reducing body, it sets up the sound wave that exists in the body and in the instrument. And I'm going to say it until I die. <laughs> and right? you've got a you've got a point. It's so though. important. It's it's something that a lot of it's brass players and and I'm guilty of it in certain scenarios. Uh, probably potentially where the more tired, like if I, you know, I mean, I haven't haven't been on a gig for a long time where I've been absolutely knackered at the end of it. But I'm sure that when I am in those situations, I probably do sometimes just as they say, ram it on and hope for the best, you know, and just all the bad stuff comes oh, well, in just to get the job done. But. But it's so it's so and pray. We have to. <laughs> exactly. But it's so nice to hear just someone just saying use the energy and and, and the demonstration I picked when uh, the thing I picked up of your demonstration was when you took the air in you breathe and then you were so relaxed talking there was no tension in your talking it was just so relaxed and then you just went and played do you know what I mean and that everything was just anyone open. anyone who teaches should be watching what happens at the end of the note yeah not at the start yeah. because that's a real sign of what's going on. Yeah. And you always see this, uh, a drop at the end of the note uh, versus drop at the start. Again, I, I can only demonstrate this as many times as hours will allow in my life. <laughs> How are you going? Chat, chat, chat. The, the, and the idea behind this, so people understand, I don't want, we, we want to eliminate the activation of, any involuntary, unnecessary musculature when it comes to playing. That's all That's all we're doing mm -hmm. is getting rid of the stuff that we don't need and only using the And so my way of trying to get the idea across is probably not the best way. There's other ways of saying it, but the idea is to just do less but do what's required. So, again, when I'm talking to you, I get a breath on board and I can go... Hi, Ben. I really love your podcast. It's a real pleasure talking to me and you. Hey, how you doing? Until we get to the line of equilibrium. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to keep talking and have a listen to what happens to my voice. It's so important. It's Certainly crucial. Yeah. Right? And just for those that haven't seen it, the way that it that works is just simply getting the air and we start low we start in the pedal tone just to get the lips apart i've got all i, I don't want to go through the whole of thing course. now we'll be here for hours well plus people people Basically, can go and lock the... onto your uh lessons and your master classes and stuff and they can come learn this from you so you know if they want more in depth they can definitely Absolutely. come to you yeah but the main one that i want them to leave with is the v for victory <laughs> see I, I get people to go ah oh, and i get them to is their jaw doesn't have to come up. Mm -hmm. up. Ah, ooh, ah, ooh, ah. So you're learning the jaw. You're learning your aperture corners using your hand. I haven't got a name for this yet. The energy into the hand. And I'm going, get the energy into the mouthpiece cup. Then. <laughs> thank you, science. Mm -hmm. We don't need to buzz the lips. We don't need to buzz the mouthpiece. If I buzz my mouthpiece, <laughs> I don't know whether you can pick, but let me tell you, it's not a sound that's going to get me a blooming TV gig anytime soon. Yeah. You know? it, you're right, though. It, it literally um, squeezes off and tightens up, doesn't it, when you do it that way? When it's just, it turns into just an amplified buzz then rather than a beautiful toned note. And correct. And students always sound like that, and we work on opening the sound up, opening the sound up until yeah. we get the beautiful East concert hall sound and then you take the mouthpiece and there's no buzz happening. Completely. It's uh... And those that demonstrate the buzz is, and let me just say on that point quickly also that I copped a lot of stick in New York for saying this line that is from a research paper in an acoustics department at a university is that, and Bob, Bob Reeves said it to me in the car as well, mm -hmm. above a high C, the instrument becomes an amplifier the fire of the mouthpiece to do with the length of the sound wave in relation to the circumference of the bell. Mm -hmm. I know nothing about this stuff. I share stuff that I learn and people can do their own research. But this guy who plays in a big orchestra hated me saying it. <laughs> What's this blip, blip, blip that he's talking about, about the sound wave and the bell? And I've got it from one of the most famous 
blooming manufacturers of brass instruments in history and an acoustics department where people study this stuff and I'm getting slammed for saying it in public. It's ridiculous. <laughs> uh, um, we've had some people come in as well. Uh, great stories of them following you. Um, it says, awesome, Greg, your recent videos to clarify fundamentals have really helped me open up massively. I uh, still have a long way to go rewiring, but the elusive uh, sympathetic uh, oscillation is there to build on now. That's amazing to hear, Simon. That's incredible, dude. Um, thanks so much for joining us here as well. Uh, Shane Gallard has uh, come in as well. Says, congratulations hey. on your teaching, Greg. Uh, it's great to listen to your amazing research and experience. I'm very privileged to have heard you play over many years and watch you go from strength to strength. Also privileged to have many beers together. Thanks so much for joining us, Shane. Uh, we've had another guy come in. Um, Jim. Oh, sorry, mate. Go. I just need to say, Shane, I did get your text message reply yesterday. Thank you, buddy, and I will reply to it. I was on the run. <laughs> <laughs> That's what these are good for as well, replying to messages. And no, like and no we didn't set – I didn't know – Shane was watching now, by the way. It's no setup. <laughs> Greg, we've had, a, we've had a great question come in. And this is probably a lot of something that uh, yep. I think a lot of people have suffered from. I definitely have at some point. Um, and I've just told myself, stop doing it. So that was handy that my brain allowed me to do that. However... This is a question from Jim uh, Bulger. Is that right, Bulger? Uh, great to see Greg on here. Can you talk about fixing body tension? I have a student with a left arm so tense it shakes and we can't make them relax to fix it. Sure. Okay, so this is getting into, uh, I call them T's, technical everyday elements. And yes, it was to do with the golf. I'm t teaching myself to play golf left-handed for a very good reason. And... So there are elements involved in everything that we've done, neurological elements that need to be developed. And focal dystonia is an activation of musculature that's not required when playing. Mm -hmm. Me slicing a golf ball into a house <laughs> is musculature <laughs> that's being activated involuntarily, right? So what we need to do, the very first movement is stillness so it's not a movement the first technical element is literally <laughs> no anxiety no nerves no shake mm -hmm. if a student is sitting there and the arm is shaking then there's issues that i'm not qualified to talk about mm -hmm. but if she's sitting there, you move your head around, up and down, side by side, round and round, shake the shoulders out, have the arms just hanging or on the sides of a chair and go, let go. Breathe down to the chair or standing up, breathe through your feet, breathe down to the floor, breathe low, breathe to the arms to see if, if you send the energy, and I've got to keep saying this to people, that when we're breathing in oxygen, we're breathing in energy. Mm hmm of energy that the body needs to survive and we can breathe out toxins right and for focal dystonia we're breathing out the anxiety the dread right so we go has the student got shaking when the arms are down i was teaching a guy in california just last week and we go through all the stuff he's done the owls and the jaws down and the body resonance is good and the hand comes up and there's a tremor I'm like, hang on, what's going on with that tremor? And he starts talking about, oh, Parkinson's disease. My dad had it. I think maybe I'm developing oh. it. And the neurologist that I'm seeing has put me on beta blockers. And I'm just going, nah, 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 nah. So what we're about to do, I'm going to, I'm doing with this guy. Sat there, breathing to the seat, breathing to the floor, breathing to the arms, oxygenating the body with positive energy and going, is there a shake in her arm now? I suspect there won't be. So then, without the instrument, start and move the elbow. Nothing else. Eyes closed. Can she move the elbow? Up and down. Is there any shake? I suspect no. Start and move the elbow and the rotator cuff in the arm. Is there any limitation in movement? Is there any anxiety? Is there any stress, any nerves? Uh, is there any shake in the arm? I would sus suspect no. This guy who's getting beta blockers for Parkinson's possible onset of Parkinson's disease had no freaking trigger in his hand when he wow. was doing this. Nothing. I said, get the horn. 
play me a low C. He's got fully blown vocal dystonia. And I picked it eventually because now I know what I'm looking for and understand it. Yeah. So the process of overcoming vocal dystonia and the process of fixing this um, young student and the process for all of us to learn is go, can we sit in stillness? Can we move our arms? And when you think about what I was demonstrating before, if I've got air in the lungs and set the shape, air behind the, the lips, what do I need to move? Elbows, rotator cuffs. That's it. Mm -hmm. I've set the corners. I've got air in the lungs. <laughs> Open the lips and no shell sound if everything's in the right position. So after that, we go, all right, so there's no shake in her arm. Let's do this. V for victory. Mm -hmm. Get her just to put her lips on her fingers. Does it start to shake then? If it does, make sure you bloom and call me. We need to talk. <laughs> right? <laughs> because that, that issue are uh, stress-related because the focal dystonia, it's like I call it the force field. To desensitise a particular girl that I'm working with that people will get to know soon because she's making an appearance on my presentation for ITG, we had to go back as far as, um, well, here's, here's the thing. Domino one is the mere suggestion of playing. The minute I suggested that we're going to do anything, the anxiety would kick in. And for months and months, I'm going, it's all that's being stemmed from the from the abdominals. And this is where the vagus nerve comes into it. But basically, um, her anxiety started before she actually got into the practice room. But then I started to recognize that it all started to go downhill the minute i suggested you see the look of fear mm -hmm. the reptilian fight and flight amygdala trauma right and so we had to break it down and i kid you not one of the big things with her is the trapezius muscle on down the spine and big contractions big time when she goes to play mm -hmm. and to the point where we settled her down settled her down settled her down moved the arm and all of the fingers would breach the force field there's a real so we did a lot of desensitizing with a pen just to eventually get the pen onto the mouth without um any reactions and this is where the whole visualization visualization thing and the idea of the portrait and the belief system is so important because we know that physically there's no problem so it's obviously a neurological issue that's manifesting in a physical you know, spasm. Uh, so basically for this student, again, I digress, but it's really important information. Um, eventually, can she put her fingers on her lips? Can she take a breath and go? <sighs> because the breath triggers a dystonia reaction. The movement of the jaw, I've got another guy in New York. I finally got him to go, hmm, without it being, hmm. Mm, but as soon as he lowered, lowered the jaw, we fix that. But then, so we could get to, then as soon as we engage the voice, so it's just slowly rewiring the circuit board that's up here that's just been fused. And we need to, I call it, you know, Ben 1.0, Ben 2.0. Yeah. And so uh, Ben Ben 2.0 has no fear of going, and believes that he can do it. So it feeds the messages through and all of a sudden there's no fight or flight. Yeah. Arduous task. But if this student can go, <laughs> then visualise it, mouthpiece, tissue stuff, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden lead pipe. And if lead pipes are expensive, get a, have I got one here, a boba straw. It's, here we are. Oops. Bubble tea. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Same thing. So uh, can she do that? What can she do? What can she kind of do? What can't she do? You know? Yeah. And then if she can do that, can she pick up the trumpet with no anticipation of playing? Arm up, arm down, arm up. So elbow and rotator cuff. No shoulder lifting. We don't lift the shoulders to pick the trumpeter. 
we bend the elbows, we rotate the shoulder cuff. Mm -hmm. Everyone does that. No. Have a look at my head. Erin? Uh -huh. Nothing to it. We get the big breath, tight throat, shoulders tight, everything's pushed, body's going to shake. For our people out there, Possibly. Actually, actually, I could probably use just my little, this here. For oh, the people out that. there, obviously when, when we got um, right hand tension, you know, it's usually this. You know, people pull them back, you know, into our faces. That's easy to solve because you just go take your bloody finger yeah. out of that. And then you end up like me and your finger yeah. sticks up every time you do something. Um, however, a lot of guys replace. They can't, I think, I think uh, another, another session of that would be they replace that tension that they think they need with this hand. You get what I mean? Yeah. Is there, is there a way yeah. that you would stop? Because I, as I said to you, I, I did that when I was younger. I replaced that when I got told yeah. to take with that. And then I just told myself, go that way, is what I told myself. Think about playing yeah. with the trumpet moving forward. And that's how I solved it. But how is that? Is that similar to what you would suggest for people like that? Absolutely. If if, if the arm pressure is creating the, the shake, I don't, I don't think that it is. It might be, but I don't think. But definitely another thing I used to do was just hold the trumpet like that. Yeah, Low grip, I'd yeah. call it. did in my first book. I don't want to talk about it anymore, but just have it sitting. There's only so much leverage you can get mm. uh, by by holding it down there. Sorry, everything's in yeah, reverse that's right. um, Yeah. Yeah. Teaching, teaching people right? so you can try that, that they don't need the pressure to play. That's probably what it is. Like you said, that's rewiring. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you only need as much pressure on the face to create a seal from the air escaping. Yeah, of course. Then yeah. we want the aperture corners, the aperture corners where the pitch changes and the, the lips in the middle need to oscillate freely. I don't care what register we're talking about. Yeah. You know, um, Mike is here is an extraordinary lead player and he would completely agree that there's just, you can't feel anything. There's no, Bobby Shue would say um, the lips, the biggest hindrance to the airflow. Mm -hmm. Right, the lips get in the way, yeah. but it's the middle, the oscillator. Yeah, we don't we don't want to feel that back up. So let's not grip. But it's easy to say don't grip, and this is why we've got to go step by step by step. The neuroplasticity things that I'm watching, thanks to a, a neurologist called Andrew Horbman, I got sent because you put stuff out into the universe and it delivers. And this guy Sean Royce uh, from Great Trombone Player Trombone 101 in California sent me this. And it's it's basically talking about yeah the different uh, chemicals and stuff. But the way we learn, especially uh, when we're older than twenty five, around that age, our our plasticity is harder to create. Everyone can do it, but we've got to do it ironically mm -hmm. by little snippets, a little bit at a time, and Small it takes steps. longer. But it only takes longer unless your life sort of depended on it or you really wanted it. All of a sudden, if you needed it to survive, you needed to play trumpet better to survive, then all of a sudden the chemicals flow better and the body re reforms better. Mm -hmm. But the real amazing thing, did you see the um, the video I put up the other day about just in response to the the forum and I was talking I about my did, golf? No. no. Right. So what I'm saying is when we play a note or when we – of Paul, that's an assessment. We don't learn at that time, right? Mm -hmm. We learn afterwards. We've done the practice. We've done the visualisation. We know what we've seen someone play trumpet. We've seen someone play golf. We've got an idea of how to do it. So then we try and replicate that. At the point of impact, we don't learn anything. Yep. But the time afterwards, you look back and go, so how did I go? And it was either terrific, terrible, somewhere in between. And it's that, that, and this was fascinating about this talk. This is the way I think. This is the way I develop all my teaching for 30 years is that you've got to embrace and use this. What can't I do? And when it yep. didn't work, we get excited about that. I said in this video, if I hit a good ball, if I hit a par or a birdie, which I've done left-handed, um, I don't celebrate that. That mm. shows the process is working. Mm -hmm. I learned when I hit eights and nines and tens. I hit a ten today. 
damn trees. Oh. <laughs> but that's where you learn. Yeah. And this guy's saying you learn from frustration. And the <laughs> oh, I'm so annoyed I can't remember it. A set of collide. <laughs> anyway, the chemicals, the neuro, the, the neurotransmitters, and the, the chemicals that are going mm-hmm. um, build up, build up. The frustration builds up. Yep. This is the learning process. And where I see people on the golf course cracking it when they hit a bad shot, I'm turning at them, going, "This, this is how you get better. Yeah, you're not a professional. You'll, you'll, yeah. Stop getting so frustrated. If you get too frustrated, you'll so end up just constantly the- hitting those shots over and over again." See, this is exactly the thing. What mm. you, you're in danger of wiring the frustration response, and then there's an anticipation, a premonition of failure, as they say in Zen in the Art of Archery, and a frustration before you go to play. But what we need to do is use that frustration as a building block. The words he used, um, we uh, cash in. He doesn't say cash in, but we cash in on the frustration and use it to our advantage because that frustration is creating the chemicals that allow neuroplasticity. Mm. Then all of a sudden you repeat, repeat based on the feeling of what you want to do. Then all of a sudden you get an inkling of something good happening. You're doing Greg stuff and you've got tissue and you visualizer and stuff, but a note doesn't happen. A note doesn't happen. You're not getting sympathetic oscillation of the thing and you're not doing it, getting frustrated and frustrated. Then all of a sudden ooh, it happens. <laughs> then the dopamine starts flowing. Yeah. The excitement starts going, the anticipation, the belief system, the portrait, you know, and we start building on positive experiences and it's the frustration factor. I, it's so bizarre. I said in this video and it's a true story. I sit there and I, if I slice a ball, I'll happily do it five times in a row mm-hmm. to observe how did I get the ball out there? Mm-hmm. It wasn't my intention. What's happening? And he's going, you just have to embrace the failures because they're not failures. They're building blocks to success. You know, and I've been saying this for years, but to see someone of, he's from Stanford University and he put this video up on the 21st of February and it's had 200,000 views. He knows what he's talking about. <laughs> um, so to, you know, this whole golf thing felt ridiculous for me. And then to go out there and actually stand on the tee at a tournament, feel confident. And here's another one for you, belief and confidence. I've got belief that I can hit a good ball because I have and I've got the portrait in my head. Do I have confidence right now that it's going to happen? <laughs> no. <laughs> I've got belief it can, but I've got no confidence that it's going to happen right now and I'm not worried about the result. If your result's driven all the time, you're going to manipulate, manipulate, and you will not learn pure process. But if you let go of the result and embrace the process, the feeling, the sound, you know, what does it look like, sound like, feel like, mm-hmm. and you embrace that, then you look at the result afterwards and go, okay, well, the process was good, but the sound wasn't terrific. What do I need to tweak without going into negative manipulation and tension? Yeah. Uh, it's wild stuff. And it I'm, I'm so excited about it because I'm only learning it. As, yeah. as, as, as I said, it's sort of validating what I've been teaching for, you know, I put the first book out in 2004 and now I'm starting to understand myself a little bit better because I understand this stuff instinctively and I don't know why. Yeah, but to have someone say this, um, and I've just had enough experience to see how what what people are doing wrong. Like that the illusion of competence video that I finally put out has opened a lot of people's eyes, even though they've done the course. And all of a sudden, they're coming back going, "Oh, now I get it," because <laughs> it's such a tough thing to get across, such a tough message to get across. And I don't know how to put. I don't know what the hell am I doing setting the studio up and trying to teach people to play trumpet. I don't know. I've got a passion for learning and, you know, I like challenges. I mean, if and anyone, like if anyone can apply um, anything that you say to their playing, they're going to become better and they've got to see it as a road forward rather than an obstacle. You know, it's a road moving forward, it's, not, you know, like do, just keep doing it. It will make you better, you know. Too many people try things is. and then stop. So. <clears throat> This is the thing. You tried a couple of times and no, I can't do it. Like you, you saw the the dream. I came up with this walking along the beach. Are you a dreamer, a dabbler, <laughs> yeah. a doer, or a driver? That's so good. Right? Yeah. The dreamers want to practice once a week and think they're going to end up in London Symphony. The the dabblers try it once and go, no, nah, it doesn't work because they don't understand it and they haven't, they 
haven't got the the uh, the principles down. <clears throat> Doers do it, but they don't actually do it the way I intend because they hear the words, but they don't actually hear the words. <laughs> and then you've got the drivers going, why doesn't it work? What am I doing wrong? Let's watch again. And the, the ultimate members that come back and come back, they're always back at Largo, always learning something new. There's so much information there. Um, but it's really hard to get these ideas across. I try my best, but people still misconstrue. Of course, yeah. You know, uh, we've, still got, we, we've got a couple more questions here for you. Um, this is a great one from Tom. Thanks for joining, Tom. He says, sometimes I get noise in my throat. Uh, what's the best way to open the throat? I call that throaticulation. <laughs> <laughs> right? There's, there's a page in the course called throaticulation. It's very common. So, Tom, and I want everyone to do this. We've done it before and we're going to do it again. Soft, slow breath, eyes closed, absolute utter recognition of how this makes the tongue go down and opens the throat up at the back. And have a listen to the sound. That's what we need to feel like all over the horn. Doesn't matter what we're playing, and excuse my non classical. That crack was because of the valve, by the way. <laughs> whether, whether I'm whether I'm doing that or open. <laughs> Whatever. The whole time it's so the question is, Tom. Where does it start? Tom is a trombone player. I will I will put that out there for you as well. So um, I'm guessing the concept yeah. is exactly the same. Absolutely. I, I mean, I play a bit of trombone. I know the more I fart, the less friends I have. You know, it's amazing. <laughs> but uh, only kidding. Just yeah. just kidding. Um, uh, it is generally caused at the articulation. As soon as the restriction of the air, whether it be at the tongue, or at the lips. It's like a mousetrap goes up and we go into a bit of El Selva, that throat clicks. Arnold Jacobs has got a a, uh, a lesson, uh, an exercise where the arms go up. Then at the top of the breath, just drop your arms down. And that's all he says, just drop the arms down. Doesn't say relax the body, doesn't say let the air come out, just says drop the arms down. I've done this at every single university um, masterclass I've ever done. And then once we drop that down, I'll say, has your throat closed? And all these kids will go, no. <laughs> <laughs> at the top of the breath, when we go to turn the air around, it happens and the, the, the throat can close off. It's just instinctive because the brain doesn't want dust or anything going down the yeah. esophagus. So it wants to close off, right? Um, or it can be induced by the articulation. So what I would really get Tom to do is make sure it's the same size rim, get get your fingers at the, the inner rim there, then go... <sighs> And keep checking in. If it's not locking there, it doesn't need to lock all over the horn. But what happens as soon as we go into player mode, you're going to grip the lips and all of a sudden the air feels the resistance at lips that are too tight. Instantly it can go off. Even, you know, uh, people question the stopping the air with the tongue. Mm. You told never ever do that. Well, all right. Let's um, let's do a little experiment, shall we? Let's play um, let's play Saint Thomas, and we're not going to stop the air with the tongue. Which might sound fine, but stylistically, it's as wrong as can be. <laughs> but if we go. Ha <laughs> ha 
we're always stopping the orchestral or commercial. We're always stopping the air with the tongue. Yeah. Um, but Greg, there is a chance that the throat will close when we stop the tongue. And I go, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so there's a chance if you hop in a car and go driving down the street, you're going to have a car accident. Does that mean we don't hop in the car? Yeah. No. You got to drive safely. Know what you're doing. It's the same with this. The throat doesn't have to close when we put the tongue in the way or the lips in the way. So it's an awareness of where is it locking up? Is it in a particular range at a particular volume? Uh, and that's where we've just got to break it down all the way back to stillness if we have to. That's great. Then um, the hum. Mm, yeah. They, thanks. Uh, he, he said that uh, it's a uh, it's thumbs up from Tom as well. So uh, thanks very much for that, Greg. Uh, a couple more questions. Obviously, guys, uh, it's you know it, it, we have been talking for quite a while, um, and mm -hmm. Greg is amazing. And I don't want to keep him all night. He has to sleep at some point in his life. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll be sitting here talking after you hang out. Oh, there you go. Okay, <laughs> fine. We'll keep it going. We do have a couple more questions, so let's get through them. Uh, Harrison Balls, come on. Uh, and he says, hey, Greg Spence, uh, fantastic stuff being said here. One question I'd love to ask is how would you go about fixing a gap in your range where you can play above it and below it? For me, I can never seem to get the double G sharp. Would love to know if you ever have, oops, sorry, that going off. Would love to know if you ever have such a problem or how you overcame it, kind regards. So am, am I assuming there that the G is good and the A is good. Is that well, kind of what that's we're That's what when he said when he said above it and below it. That's what I got from that as well. Right. So put it this way, and I'm sure I, I think this is out of Wayne's mouth. Wayne Bergeron, as you know, can play the most beautiful double high A's <laughs> yeah, that ridiculous. arguably have ever come out of a trumpet. Yeah. Right. But he admits that the G for him, which is very unusual, normally the G is you know. People can get to the G and that's their breaking point. And then anything above that is, uh, you know, good luck sort of thing. Yeah. Because the, the the energy expulsion is just expired at the G, right? Mm -hmm. But he gives all the Gs. If it's G heavy, he gives it to Dan Fenero on mm. second because his Gs are super, super solid and rock, rock solid. Now, I've heard that from a few sources. And if I'm wrong, I apologise to Wayne and Dan. But that's what I've heard is that we've got notes that are more comfortable for individuals. It's a, just a unique thing that we've got weak spots and more solid spots. And that's where I'd, I'd get you just to really focus on the idea of the aperture corners, tongue position, the idea of the air going up. We could talk about airstream and air pivots and all this stuff for freaking hours, and I won't. But I like the side of the air going up to stop that bottom lip rolling back over. Even though you know, Bobby Shoe, Roger Ingram, these cats all from Bud Brisk Boy. Mm. It was all about air pivots and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I question it only because things should be questioned. I think it's a send back and I've had acoustics to look at it and they say the same. The feeling is up. The feeling is up. Uh, and I, I figure once the energy gets through that rim, trying to direct it, uh, I'm just, I, I'd love to say, yep, I agree with it, but I just don't. And I don't have any empirical evidence that suggests otherwise. Um, I've always thought that what could work going up should work going down. Lo and behold, after I was at North Texas State doing a masterclass, oh no, well, um, uh, Alan Vizzuti was there, I think a week before or two weeks before. And he goes, of course, double C, where's the air going? Bottom of the cup. Mm. Low C, where's the air going? Top of the cup. Adam Rapper. I did a master class with him for uh, in Copenhagen. It was five hours we did. I, I went first. I wasn't going to go after him. <laughs> and um, he he goes, of course, when, when I send the air up, what note's going to come out? And he said low C. And I'm like, huh? Yeah, and then when double C, it's down low. I believe it's a sensation that people. I've got a video in my course called SPS Squeaky Nettle, Squeaky Pedals. It's science, sensation, psychology, and we can get caught up in our sensations, but there's actually no scientific validity behind it. Mm -hmm. But like the arched tongue, if you say to someone, "Arch your tongue," and you're going to play higher, and someone arches their tongue and they play higher, I've got no problem with that. 
It's not what's happening, but if it works, it works. Who cares? I got this video with a guy playing trumpet out of his ear. Sure, he wasn't playing it. It was someone else playing it. But the idea is you've got to be open-minded. Yeah. Um, and so we don't need to know all the particular elements in the cycle of T's. If it's if we don't need to know it and it's working, sure, fine. Yeah, completely. Um, yeah, so it's a matter of uh, finding. Now, I don't attempt this, but we'll see. Imagine aperture corners, tongue position, and the idea of the air going up. So if low A is out here, loose. Now, I have not done this in 12 months. I'm just setting up. This might fail, typically, <laughs> right? Loose. So get your magnifying glass out. Where's my tongue when I do that? Certainly not at the Feel what your face is doing. Then when we go to a middle A, some people might sense air going up or air going down. What are the corners doing? What's the tongue doing? Is the, are the abdominals engaging? Is the throat closing? All right? Eyes closed. Eyes open for learning. Eyes closed for storing. We were, we were rewiring, looking around the system. Then, so we've gone low A, just a nice simple picture. Low A, middle A. Low A, middle A, aperture corners. I want the horizontal movement inwards of the aperture corners. That's the sensation. Why? To eliminate the pitch, the pinch. I want pitch change to be felt this way, not this way. Mm -hmm. So the whole mao, which come and check out the site. Ow, ow. I want the energy to be coming this way, so no pinch, right? So if we've got low A and middle A, well, where's A above the stave? If the, if, if, if the tongue's here for, for low A, and it's there for middle A, high A should be there somewhere. Must be here somewhere. I don't know. Never played an A above the stave. Let's just go on theory. Let's just see what happens. But we know not. We know that there's less air going through the horn as we play higher. Of course, we all know that, and we can demonstrate that nice and easily. There's less air being lost. Most apparently, five percent of the energy is emitted in sound. Most of it's lost to the friction of the pipe or keeping the sound wave mm -hmm. alive. Again, I don't even know if there's such things as a sound wave. I'm just assuming based on smarter people than me that it's true. <laughs> Low A, middle A, high A. Low A, middle A, high A. Let's just try it and see what happens. Okay, that works. So double A is a shocker, right? Low A, middle A, high A. Double A must be here somewhere. Tongue must be somewhere. I don't know where. Never played one before. Let's try it. Oh, yeah, that works. Cool. you got to find it based on some simple principles. Now, whether that's the going and is no big scientific study whatsoever. It's a sensation, it's an understanding, an idea. But we know that we don't want to com com uh, compromise. <sighs> and he, just on that topic, when I was back doing the trombone stuff, I remember, because it developed pretty good, trumpet, trombone, trumpet, trombone, trumpet, trombone, trumpet, trombone. And I go, oh, let's see if I play a high B flat. Oh, what about that? I went. <laughs> And then to play a high B flat, and it was this. <laughs> and then there were studies done by, um, studies done by uh, 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 the Chicago Symphony guys, um, Bud Herseth and um, Jacobs was there, and Charlie Vernon, and they were at some place, a hospital or somewhere, and they were doing uh, velocity sort of research. And of course, the frequency of a middle C on trumpet 
is the same frequency, now you can play middle C easy. Mm. The same frequency as a high B flat on trombone. So why on earth am I going <laughs> yeah. for a high B flat when I can go? So you put the trombone on and go. Oh, overshot, oh. but yeah. <laughs> Right, the psychology behind it's just uh, amazing, and a lot of it's based on instinct. And again, if you want to blow your throat out on a voo voo something, go with your instinct. But otherwise, you've got to start and look at what's going on and break it down. It's Massive very thing. logical. It's all very logical. I hope that's uh, I hope that's helped you, Harrison. Um, one one thing I'm experimenting at the moment because my my break my non found note is a double B. Um, I can play it. Right. Some days I can play it and some days I can't. And like you, I'm sitting there on the days I can play it, analyzing why I can play it and why I can't. And I'm trying to figure that out right now. Um, but things I am trying as well, uh, things that I've heard of, is obviously different valve combinations, but uh, extending slides as well at the same time. I'm trying to, when I find it, I'm trying to train this, that that's what, you're, that's what you need to do. And once that needs knows how to do it then i just add that like you said energy and it would just pop out so but i, I have yeah. a habit of and always going what double B flat to the c and then just and not finding that in between there you go so you know it's there it's, you go yeah. so yeah tough, t- tough problem to have mate can i <laughs> can i can i um suggest something when yes, you do please. it and you're going and you've been thinking about it you've been thinking about the feeling of it you've got because you've done it before Mm. So when you've played one that is ringing its head off, right, Mm -hmm. instantly take an MPEG of that and put it on the feature wall, the mind's feature wall, get the portrait of what you just did, what did it look like, what did it feel like, what did it sound like, and store it, put your damn horn down and go walking around. You can practice it in your mind. And if you store it deeply enough, then when you come back, you can recall the practice that you've been doing. Then after the note, put the horn down and go, how did it go? Mm-hmm. And how did it compare to the visualisation? Because that visualisation is the neural pathway. We're not training muscles. Muscles are dumb. We're training nerves to energise and act. So we've got to get the nerves right. And the nerve are done in the brain and the brain is trained by the visualization thanks for that less I, horn yeah, i will be doing yeah. that and uh and what i'll do is i might i send you a cheeky video on, on how i'm getting on with it <laughs> so you'll, it. you'll be really annoyed by the end of it if it's just the high notes of you no no <laughs> and i'll share it the same way as you shared me in, in my australia day suit <laughs> yeah yeah fair one i better i better get it right then eh? <laughs> um <laughs> right. Martin, martin's come on uh with a question for you he says uh thanks do you have a an opinion on warming down at the end of a practice day are there benefits to focusing the lips uh with examples of pianissimo clark technical studies after you've entered the square i think it is very subjective uh at times i would warm down at times i would let the body do its thing naturally i would always yeah just get the blood circulating at the end of the day we just their muscles they need blood fresh oxygen blood uh, cold beer on the chops and uh, assuming you're over 18, Martin, of course, <laughs> which I'm pretty sure you are, and and a warm shower. That's I'd a- rarely play at the end of, of, of gigs. Um, and I would be more, if I feel like I'd really blown myself out, which I didn't do in the last few years, you know, because... Shane Shane was watching. Shane said to me a couple of years ago, you've never done a video on how you can keep playing after hours and hours. You get stronger as you go along. And I thought, well, I've never thought about it. But it's all about efficiency. Um, but to the point uh, that I feel like I have, I've done any damage. But if I had felt like, oh, man, I'm beat up and I've got to do a delicate performance in the morning or something, mm. then I would definitely just very softly, not long, just get the blood circulating. So to be slow, I wouldn't want anything taxing, but just, you know, even just a low C hum mm. and uh, get the get the feeling of, of that. 
Um, and then on about three occasions, and I think it was only three, maybe four at a push, when I'd had huge days of full-on rehearsals, full-on gig, big day the next day, I'd take an anti-inflammatory. I don't recognize, uh, rec uh, recommend it all the time, but mm -hmm. I'd take a Nurofen tablet and you wake up and you uh, But I say that with, I'm not a doctor, I can't prescribe it. That's what I did. <laughs> yeah. And I know people that were taking more of it and it concerned me a lot. Uh, I don't think you need to, but it did help occasionally. And, and Mike might be sitting there going, Greg, don't say that, whatever you do. <laughs> but I, I I did it a couple of times and, and it helped under extreme circumstances. Mm -hmm. I hope that's helped, Martin. Um, for for me personally, uh, just to add my little two bobs in there as well. The, uh, keep keep your eyes yeah. open because there are uh, there's there's a cream out there now developed, uh, American company called Robertson Remedies, uh, and at at any time, like because uh, my majority of my day job in a normal year is marching band. So if you can imagine stamping down the road with two planks of wood on your feet, slamming that instrument into your into your face a bit sometimes you do get some swelling and if you do uh there's one there there's an anti-swelling thing um and yeah i just as greg said i'll either put some warm water on my chops and just do that and then i'll put some robertson robertson remedies uh on it uh, or something that will just help the swelling just slightly come down a bit um Great. and like bobby shoe <laughs> says bobby shoe says he said just you got to warm down these and warm down these that's it so he just and he's does the cheek thing so you know it's uh yeah mm. so i hope that yeah. helps martin yeah so oh there you go uh mike lovett's yeah. come on as well and mike lovett says arnica tablets is what is something that he recommends as well um martin so they sound a lot more natural yeah it's probably i'm uh, not sure whether that yeah. that sounds sounds herbal i'm not sure but it, it sounds like it, it could be it could be yeah so um, i hope that's I'm not, martin. I, I'm, yeah. yeah um so greg uh, i've kept you for two hours chatting along uh it's been an absolute pleasure Beautiful. to have you on just before you go i usually do a segment called yep. what's on your stand are you playing at the moment sorry on I, on my sorry it's so i usually do a segment called uh what's in your yeah I'll, I'll just play it for you So this segment's called What's On Your Stand. So if you're practicing anything that's particularly that you're working for at the moment, some maybe some exercise book that no one's ever heard of, uh, or maybe your own exercise book that, you, you know, you you work out of yourself, uh, just, you know, just something that um, the guys may not have heard of before and could look up. If I, if I need to get my chops back in for a gig, I put on a backing track of Carnival of Venice that sounds like a piano accordion thing. And I'll play the Carnival of Venice through 10 times in the day. But that's, I haven't needed to do that because there's no Damani gigs coming up. But I do, I'm just going to blow my own trumpet here. I've got this range of exercises called the Singing Sea Series. And one day it will be recognised for what it is because it's based on the hum, it's based on efficient low C, then adding harmonic after harmonic after harmonic after harmonic, both tongued and harmonic slurs, with man glass out to make sure there's no engagement, and just sit there and basically, with the feeling of the hum, and I don't care what it sounds like, remember results don't matter, it's process mm -hmm. here. Then can I go to the next harmonic? This might be a good one for, was it, uh, Tom with his G sharps. Ah, uh, no, that was uh, uh, no, it wasn't Tom. That was Harrison. Harrison, yeah. And then, can I add another hum on it? <laughs> and finding that using the energy of the low C and not engaging, mm -hmm. but then I'll get louder on the second step. <laughs> And finding at which point the body needs to become involved. And I want to say here that I don't want vo volume to come from engaging the body. I want the body to fill the gap when the aperture gets wider. <laughs> That's a reverse way of thinking about it. Then there's harmonic slurs. And the first one is all active. <laughs> I 
I don't do it that fast, but mm. the time now. Yeah. Then the next step is getting incrementally softer each bar until the point that it's passive in the last bar. Then the next one is passive all the way up, getting louder. Then the very last ones are passive. Uh -huh. No, you don't. Nothing engaged in my body, and I'm the harmonic slurring sixteenths, yeah. and, and people go, "That's not possible." Well, yes, it is. <laughs> if you were, if I can do it, anyone can do it. It's just efficiency. You know? I love how you say that. You always say that in your videos. If I can do it, anyone can do it. It's like, all right, all right. Oh, it's Greg. true, mate. <laughs> I know I'm it just is. A, I know. It's true. Yeah, it's just started is. off playing a corner in a bloody country brass band in Victoria. You know. Yeah, it's like this. It's it's. Um, I saw a workshop with uh, Wayne Bergeron, and he said. Uh, Playing music is about a discovery, just discovering how you do it yourself, you know. So you just, you're nailing Absolutely. it. Yeah, exactly. So um, that's all I can do is share my experiences. Oh, yeah. And and you've shared more than uh, than we could have expected this morning. And it's, well, it's morning for us, evening for awesome. you, uh, which has been incredible. I think a lot of people here have got uh, some great things out of it. Um, can I just quickly awesome. to finish off, uh, can, can mm -hmm. you give me... Um, name say some three albums or three things for people to go listen to that that has sculptured you into the into the person you are and player you are today they don't have to be well, top I've albums got to go just, back to... just three good ones no no well what at me as the music that i liked sidewinder lee morgan yeah fire shaker oh maynard ferguson mm -hmm. and Probably something uh, Maurice Andre, Baroque, piccolo -y. I can't think of any particular album, mm -hmm. but I would listen to a lot of pick stuff just to, not that I've got a piccolo here, pardon me, I've got a pick, but I don't really play it. Uh, yeah, just I think they're the things that made my ear go, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> you know? That's amazing. Um, oh, Tower of Power, Earth, Wind and Fire. Oh, yeah. You know, anything that grooves that is, is what works for me. Anything that yeah. gets me happy. Yeah. That's my business. That's um, uh, what if you had an opportunity to go back? What would be the one advice you'd give yourself? <laughs> Say no. Say no. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Fair one. Not going to elaborate. Yeah, that's fine. We'll go with that. Uh, no, no, no. I'm being, I'm being silly. I'm talking. I'm talking my marriage. Oh, marriage. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, no, look, I if if I wouldn't change, I've got no regrets. I wouldn't change anything because I love the life I've got now and you have ups and downs and big kicks in the backside yeah. and you learn from it. Uh, and I, I could not, you can tell just sitting here talking, I'm in a really good place and I love what I'm doing. I love learning and... Uh, I, I wouldn't change anything. That's you know? amazing. I just, I'm, I'm yeah, yeah, I'm, uh, uh, yeah, no, nothing. <laughs> um, and I usually if ask I can, about, can... oh, sorry, I, 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 yeah, go for it. You, you no, no. Say? Okay, I was just going to say, I usually ask um, a funny story uh, from a gig that you've done, but you've already covered that. So what I want to do just before we sign off is, oh, you want to say one, don't you? Well, see, the thing is, it's not a funny story, but it was actually what, what I wanted to finish with. Oh, please go. I was, was going to – don't was... forget about your ITG stuff, though, because I want I want people to be able to find that. So, Well, okay, for sure. And yeah. this ties in. Okay, good. Let's do that And it then. ties in <laughs> to um, uh, everything. Mm -hmm. So I've moved to Queensland. I get called by the Queensland Symphony Orchestra to go in and do two days of recording – for the opening ceremony of the Gold Coast Commonwealth Games. Mm -hmm. Okay. The book is long, high, loud, lots of it. I know no one in the orchestra. Oh, one of the trumpet players I've met once. And so the let's say the butterflies were, you know, having a little fly around and Greg, how did you end up? What what okay, hang on. Right. -o. So uh they're playing an orchestral piece for the first piece of the first session on the first day. We had four sessions, four three-hour sessions with all this ridiculous music to play. And so I could feel the anxiety just building up a little bit. And 
but that's okay. But a few butterflies because it's a pressure gig and a lot of important people around and an orchestra of people going, who's this clown? <laughs> and um, so as I'm getting my horn out of the case, I know what I'm like. I've, I've known myself a while. Um, <laughs> so I know what I'm going to do is get up there and play the first piece and try and mark my territory. I can play, <laughs> relax, we're going to have fun, but I'm going to overcook it yeah. and then I'm going to suffer because I've got two days of recording to do. <laughs> so just practice what you're freaking preaching. <laughs> and so I was getting my horn out of the case, just going, mm, don't play harder than that. Mm. Don't play harder than that, Greg. Don't play harder than that. The butterflies went away. That's weird. Okay. So then a few minutes went past and they started again. And I'm reminding myself, don't, Mm. So, of course, Mr. Analysis here, my brain's working overtime trying to figure out what the <laughs> hell's going on here. I was calm. Sat down in the section, phone's on, here goes the first take. And I did hum to remind myself not to overblow. Mm -hmm. But there was no anxiety at all. Amazing. And I... I'm like, what the hell's going on here? And so I was telling this woman up here who's a, a healer. There's lots of all sorts of interesting <laughs> people up around on the coast. And I was telling her about this experience. And she goes, oh, that's the vagus nerve. Now, what the heck is the vagus nerve? And so I'm starting to research it more and more with the uh, chemicals and everything. <laughs> I still can't remember their names. Um, no reprenoprin. No repenoprin. Apenoprin. Epinephrine. There it is. And that, epinephrine. epinephrine. Yeah, epinephrine. Right. I've heard that before. Yeah. Yeah. We, we got there. And oxycolotin something. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so what's happening? There's there's anxiety in adrenaline and all this sort of stuff. And the serotonin that travels through the vagus, it's the biggest nerve that runs between the gut and the brain. Yep. And the serotonin flow that gives us keeps us calm gets inhibited. And when you hum. It's like a massage and all of a sudden things start to flow properly. The vibration of the humming relaxes the nervous system. Things become calm, the chemicals release and all of a sudden there's calmness. So before my last gig in Melbourne, which was with the Melbourne Symphony playing West Side Story with the movie live, mm. my room is looking down at the concert, <laughs> freaking out. <laughs> Walking down the street before rehearsal, anxiety building, mm, saying, go away. It's like a barking dog. You go, no, nah, mm -hmm. sit down. Yeah. Mm, got to side of stage. Mm, I don't know whether you know the book, but this opening of the show. Double IF shouted from about eight bars and it's the minuendos and the minuendos. You can't do that if you've got any kind of anxiety or wobbles in the body. You've got yeah. to be chilled to play this and it went beautifully. And I'm uh, just to experience that and go, wow, this is the body doing some stuff based on, I'd make sense about meditation and, um, and all this stuff that's been around for a million years. They've known about it forever, but to experience it by accident was kind of wild. And that ties into the focal dystonia stuff. It ties into playing. It ties into performance anxiety. Ties into everything, the belief system. It's an incredible, incredible thing, this body of ours. Mm. And, and uh, that's that's probably highlight gig. And the biggest one part of that was at the end of it, I played really well. The conductor stands up and spotlight on me and everyone claps in the auditorium. And I'm almost, I'm, I'm almost in tears because I live yeah. up here. And if I never do another gig in my life, I don't care because yeah, I've, exactly. I've, I've done it. I've been there, done it. Yeah. You know, I love doing what I'm doing now. You know, so it's definitely it's something I'm going to try now. It's uh, uh, learning just, yeah, just, just learning how to deal with Eyes closed. nerves when it comes in, listening to your body. Eyes closed. Yeah. And just understanding what's going on and, and, and letting it just chill, let it flow. Mm. And is it going to happen instantly for everyone? No, of course not, but it can be done. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So, well, Greg, awesome, uh, buddy. Uh, thanks so, so much. And everyone out there, you need to head to Mystery 
for mastery um it is get the link is in the description of this video on youtube and facebook click it go check it out it's incredible uh greg i look forward to seeing the your involvement with itg it's going to be great um, uh, yes i, I first yeah. first of june first of june american time i think at either 1 30 or 3 30 like maybe 3 30 on the first of june american time mm -hmm. and the 5th of june my 50th birthday so i'm inviting Ooh. everyone to my 50th birthday party uh i will be doing an interactive q a after my session at 4 30 a.m <laughs> on my 50th birthday uh can't wait it's going to be wow. great the first one busting Busting and building beliefs for better brass playing. The first one's the psychology and the process. The second one's the the exercises. I'll you know? definitely be so trying to pop in myself. So I yeah, I really really hope it works out. Uh, everyone else, I encourage you to do the same. As you just heard over the last two hours, Greg is a wealth of knowledge, and I hope what he said is going to change everyone's playing because I'm going to go away with my magnifying glass and look at my own playing and make sure that I'm doing it all properly. So, yes. did you know what happens? <laughs> The light comes on. Yeah, eventually, you invite, you invite the body to do something enough times and eventually it will. Exactly <laughs> right. Well, thanks so much, uh, Greg, for giving up all your time. I can't wait, buddy, to have a beer with you at some point and talk shop and just relax uh, in this world of craziness. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you. Everyone in here has had a great time uh, and I can't thank you enough. Awesome. So look after yourself. And I can't wait to catch up. Thank soon. you. Drop, drop me a line at the website. Come and say hello at the site and check out all the stuff. It'll be great. See Do you later. It, ladies and gentlemen, and go check out his YouTube pages and all his associate social media because he always puts stuff up and it's so helpful. And I hope you get uh, you got as much out of this as I did. So everyone else out there, you stay safe in the practice room and love your work. <laughs>